Ayşe da. Açın. Hello from my side. Uh, a very warm welcome to you and especially a warm welcome to our today's keynote speaker, Rod McKinsey. Um, don't, uh, don't worry, I'm not Gabriela, like stated in the invitation. My name is uh, Ewald Volk. I'm academic director of media management here at the University of Applied Studies. And um, I, I have to ad address the best wishes from Gabriela. She, she went sick on Tuesday. She opened the key, she did the welcome address at another keynote from Rod McKenzie uh, with participants from the media industry. And after this welcome address here in the TV studio, she got sick. So I hope it's not a bad sign for, for us. She got a very bad cold, so we turned down. Oh, we, we, we did a lot of more temperature here in the room. Normally it's colder. It has to be colder here for working. Um, I want to address my sincere thanks to the Austrian Federation of, uh, the Federation of Austrian Industries uh, for this cooperation. Uh, especially a thanks to Mrs. Reutner, Mr. Drashtak, and especially to you, Mr. Posch. We are very keen on, on, on this kind of cooperation uh, with your federation uh, because uh, we do a cooperation in the field of communication topics in the wider sense uh, because you might not be aware of the fact that this institution, the, the uh, University of Applied Studies here in St. Pölten is one of the biggest player in educating uh, students in uh, media skills. We have nearly 1,000 students in different media uh, studies here. We have a department of media technology and we have a department of uh, um, uh, media economics. And um, we do not educate journalists here, like the other big players do. We, let's say we have three big players here in Austria in the field of media, but the other are concentrated on journalists' education. What we do here is, for example, here in media management, where I'm academic director, is of course we include journalism basic skills, but it's only a few courses in journalism basics. Uh, but we have a lot of other topics you might be interested, like business communication, internal, external business communication, public relations. These all are uh, part of our uh, curricula here at the university. So that's why we are so keen to have you here. Uh, uh, only roughly half of our students go to the media industry. The other half goes to business like you are representing. Uh, uh, I would say there are already a lot of your member companies uh, 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 giving jobs and job careers to our students. The ÖMV is uh, very, very, very strong in that. Uh, are offering internships for our students. Obviously, they are satisfied with our education here because otherwise they wouldn't do it year by year. Of course, we want to, in to increase that. So maybe when you think next time of hiring communication experts, you think on, on, on our institution. Uh, now, to introduce Rod McKenzie to you, of course, he can do this much better than I could do. Uh, from, from the I tried very brief. From the profession, he is a journalist. He held several positions as an editor in broadcasting. Uh, he's actually he's head of development in local radio at the BBC. And, and in his really impressive career, he won several very prestigious awards. Uh, the Radio Academy Award, or, or known also as Sony Radio Award. And Today he will address to us the question, uh, and, and I'm sure also not only the question, and he will have some answers uh, to his question, how to get the message through in a, in a world of more and more fragmented media. 
I hope you will enjoy the keynote and I hope we will have a lively discussion. And Mr. Posch, the floor is now yours. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Falk. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, please welcome here uh, at the uh, University of Applied Science in St. Burton. It is my pleasure um, having you here as our guest today. And when I say we, I'm talking um, for the Federation of Austrian Industries, the lower group of uh, lower, uh, the regional group of Lower Austria. My name is Eddie Posch, and I'm the like in charge of uh, communications for the Federation of Industries in Lower Austria. Well, uh, Mr. Falk already um, introduced our tonight's guest, uh, Mr. McKenzie. Mr. McKenzie, it's also my pleasure to welcome you here in St. Bolton, and we're um, pleased to have you here as our guest. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, and yeah, just before we get started, I also would like to thank Mr. Falk and his team and Mrs. Fiegel for um, the good cooperation, for the good um, preparation of tonight's meeting. And um, also th thank you very much to all the students, which I unfortunately can't see because of the light, um, which are standing behind the cameras, um, making it possible that people um, like our communications experts from the co from our member companies um, can follow tonight's um, meeting via live stream at home. Thank you very much for your support as well. Yes, um, then I would say let's get started. Mr. McKenzie, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Eddie, and, and, and thanks to Evelt as well. Um, we're just going to do something technical, and then it's all going to be okay because there's just a little countdown going on. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I got a, a, a build up there, so you've got a, a bit of an idea of what, what I do. But in very simple terms, I'm a BBC suit, which is why I'm wearing a suit. And, um, uh, you know, I really hope that you will join in on this. Um, why, why me and why the BBC? Well, you know, the BBC is pretty much uh, often at the forefront, at the, in the firing line uh, of uh, media stories. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is and why people would want to think we were a big story uh, in, in a moment. But it just gives you some sort of frame of, of who I am and what I'm doing. So I'm a journalist as Evelt said, by profession, but I'm also a, 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 an executive and, um, you know, I've been involved in lots of things with the BBC over time. So this is the, 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 the thesis, if you like, the, the, the basis of what we're talking about tonight. Um, and I really don't want to make this too much about me talking at you, uh, because I think you will have got some good examples or some bad examples, perhaps, of things that went wrong um, in the world of PR and how businesses can influence that. Um, and, I've, and I think really, you know, the background to what I'm going to talk about with you tonight is it used to be so much easier. It used to be so much easier if you were under fire and you're a company and you're under fire uh, to be able to manage events. But in the modern world, uh, with social media, it can spiral so quickly out of control and your brand is damaged, uh, you're damaged, it could cost you your job. So we don't want that to happen. So what can you do to avoid that? And what are the pitfalls and what are the uh, possible solutions? Okay, well, um, my clicker is refusing to click. Which is interesting. Isn't, isn't that always the way? I'll tell you what I'll do on the, on the keyboard. It's fine. Um, it really isn't working today, is it? Okay, that'll do. I'll do it on the, on the keyboard. Right. Um, that's Harold Macmillan. Uh, he's a British Prime Minister, or was a British Prime Minister many, many years ago before I think anyone in this room was born. Um, and uh, he uh, was Prime Minister from, in, in, the late, in the late 50s, the early 60s, a time of change. Um, that's brilliant, thanks. A, a time of change, uh, a, a moment when uh, the Cold War was at its height, um, 
uh, there was a young and dynamic president in, in America at the time, John F. Kennedy, uh, and he was the sort of elder statesman, uh, the, the grandfather figure, if you like, to John F. Kennedy's young, dynamic, thrusting uh, new, new man. Um, and uh, in the end, as usually happens in British politics, it all ended in disaster and he lost an election and uh, the Labour Party came into power and a new prime minister and the world moved on. But the reason I've put this slide up um, is, is really a quote from him. Uh, and he was once asked by a reporter, what was most likely to blow a government off course? What's the thing that's most likely to do for you in government? And he replied in his very posh, upper-class, patrician way, events, my dear boy, events. And when you think about it, that's absolutely true. Uh, you can do all the corporate planning you like. You can do the strategic work. You can have a three-year business plan or a five-year business plan, whatever you like. You can have away days with lots of free sandwiches and fruit. And you can have PowerPoint presentations from strategists uh, and uh, corporate high flyers. But at the end of the day, it's the thing you can't see that you can't anticipate that often does for us. Um, so, you know, forget this is not a time to think about the S-curve. This is about random events and how you cope with them. Um, so just one random event... Uh, that you didn't see coming can scupper all your three-year, five-year, ten-year business plans, whatever it is, and leave you as helpless as a fish flapping on a dry beach. I'm not going to talk about the events themselves because, uh, you know, I'm not some sort of weird futurologist who's going to tell you exactly what bad thing is going to happen to you next week. You need an uh, astrologer for that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and talk about the practical effects of how you deal with those things, the genuine unknowns, if you like. Um, and some of those will come from what, uh, you know, we British like to call cock-ups. Uh, and some of them will come from the web or social media or some other source. You just don't know. But it, this is stuff that damages you and can cripple you. So how do you cope? Uh, well, I'm going to run through in the next few slides a, a few real kind of public relations disasters that are well known to me. They might be well known to you, in which case apologies, but I think there are still um, lessons and, and examples you can kind of pull from that. And I might ask you um, uh, if what you would have done if you were running the corporate PR team at the time. So uh, let's start with this man. Tony Hayward. Now, um, I'm, I think you probably all know, but just in case, he was the chief executive of BP at the time of the massive oil slick from one of his rigs uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And 60,000 barrels of oil were pouring into the sea and threatening an environmental disaster. And he uh, went through what can only be described as a series of PR gaffes during which he said things like the environmental damage won't be that bad. Uh, worse things have happened, you know, effectively at sea, as they say. Um, and at one spectacular moment when the uh, oil was spilling out into the Gulf of Mexico and washing ashore on the coast of the United States, he went on his yacht, he's a keen yachtsman, and he went sailing on his yacht on a weekend off. Now, I'm a big believer and I hope you are too, that uh, a work-life balance is important and all senior executives should take time out to uh, do what they want to do. And it's not all about work. But this was perhaps not the best time to do it. And uh, it led at the time to the White House Chief of Staff uh, having something to say about it, which hopefully I will be able to bring you. Nope, there. Okay. I think we can all conclude that Tony Hayward uh, is not going to have a second career in PR consulting. This has just been a part of a long line of PR gaffes and mistakes. But beyond that photo, 
There's really a substance here that matters. That's clearly a PR mistake, but he's made a number of those mistakes. What's important is, are we capping the well? Are we capturing the oil? Okay, so that's Rahm Emanuel, who um, uh, was the uh, Obama's White House chief of staff at the time. And um, uh, he uh, kind of pretty much n nails it there in terms of um, the issue. Um, it wasn't a triumph, was it? And uh, I think in, in, in the kind of modern sense, it's one of the biggest big cock-ups. And um, some of these other cock-ups we're going to talk about are peculiarly British affairs. And, of course, the British are really good at cock-ups, and I'm sure you all know that. But this was an international cock-up by a British person, helpfully, so that kind of keeps the theme going that the Brits are a bit useless at the best of times. But anyway, um, so let's move on to another... Um, Man, this is Gerald Ratner. It's not a real gun, and he's not really going to shoot himself. But he did have enough of a sense of humour to realise the mistake he made might have led him to want to do that. Now, 20 years ago, Ratner's was uh, a shop on the high street of Britain. Uh, and and every, just about every high street had it. Um, uh, and uh, it was a jeweller's. And they sold reasonably priced jewellery. I'm being kind. Reasonably priced jewellery. And millions of Britons got their engagement rings there. Um, men bought their wives and mistresses, uh, Christmas necklaces. Uh, and uh, it was all going quite well. You know, it was a thriving business. Until he gave an interview in which he described one of his decanters as, and I quote, total crap. Uh, and it seems to me that if you're ever in business, you never really want to describe anything you make or sell as total crap. Um, now, that wasn't the end of it, because he then went on to say that one of the sets of the earrings that he sold uh, for a pound, they were this was cheap, affordable stuff we're talking about here, um, he said, it's cheaper than a prawn sandwich, but probably won't last as long. OK, you're getting a bit of a flavour of this. The papers had an absolute field day with this. And uh, day after day after day, there were stories about, you know, what's crap at Ratner's. And people, journalists would be sent in, reporters would be sent into the store to ask, you know, the poor hapless sales assistant, what have you got that's really crap? And um, are, you, are you clear with uh, crap? Am I, yeah, crap, shit, yeah? Okay. Uh, and it became a kind of running gag. Anyway, uh, the effect was totally disastrous because £500 million uh, was wiped from the share value of Ratner's. He lost his job. Uh, the firm was rebranded and Ratner's doesn't exist on the high street anymore. Um, so, you know, it's it's not just a bad strategy, it's a suicide strategy. Uh, right, OK. Um, this is another um, British cock-up. Uh, this is Terminal 5 at Heathrow Airport, uh, which was opened in 2008. And there was a huge fanfare about it. We, were, we journalists, were, were told by British Airways uh, that this was going to be uh, the most spectacular airport in the world. It was can handle more passengers more efficiently, uh, get people away on their flights better than ever before, get them off flights better than ever ever's been done before, and and get them on their way. Um, so a huge build up, which ran for months and months and months on on what was pretty much a, a PR offensive, if you like, by uh, British Airways. Well, uh, when it finally opened in two thousand and eight, it was an utter shambles, and. That's a day one picture of people um, with bags that they can't check in because the computers weren't working. Um, the check-in desks weren't working because the computers weren't working. Uh, the staff were under-trained and under overstressed. Uh, everyone was angry. Uh, noth literally nothing worked. Um, it was 
a complete disaster. And it was the lead on the news bulletin. So we'd been told that this great thing was happening and actually it's a total disaster. Terminal 5 at Heathrow, which some of you may have travelled through, cost £4.3 billion pounds to make. But this catalogue of errors saw on day one 216 flights cancelled and 15,000 bags either delayed or lost or sent somewhere else. Uh, and anger grew as uh, the British Airways press office appeared not to accept any responsibility for this. They blamed others for the fiasco uh, and they described them as teething problems. Well, if that's teething problems, what happens when you've got a serious toothache? Later they admitted this was not their finest hour. And one uh, newspaper columnist wrote, uh, Britain does fiascos very well, but this was a corker. And I think he's probably right. Nowadays, of course, we have social media with its own built-in potential for disaster, especially when it comes to hashtags. This is Susan Boyle. Uh, she was discovered as a talented, if not very beautiful, singer on a talent show in the UK. She was snapped up by a record company, so they enthusiastically plugged her new album with a Twitter hashtag, which I would now like you to look at carefully. And, OK, she's Susan. It's a new album, and there's a party to go with it. But you could read it another way. Now, how it's possible to come up with a hashtag on the simple basis that, oh, well, it's Susan, she's got a new album, and we're going to have a party, fine. But did no one notice what it also says? OK. It's not a triumph, is it? And then there's the BBC. Uh, the world's biggest broadcasting or or organization is publicly funded, as you know, funded by a universal license fee that everyone with a TV pays in the UK. It's about 150 euros a year. For many on the right in Britain, uh, this is an unpopular poll tax, uh, and one which the critics say leaves the BBC very well funded to operate in areas against commercially funded opposition, which is struggling in a very competitive marketplace. The UK broadcasting industry is nothing if not competitive. It's a sort of, the critics would say, uh, a bulletproof public sector firm uh, that annoys its critics in rival newspapers and websites who often use their media to attack, some on a daily basis, the BBC. It's therefore only a very slight parody that a satirical magazine in the UK recently ran a mock headline lampooning a right-wing daily paper's possible headline which said, BBC to blame for Ebola. OK. Um, and that's kind of the way it is sometimes at the BBC. You can blame the BBC for more or less everything, even the Ebola crisis. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think the BBC does appear to be its own worst enemy. Uh, we had a recent revelation. Um, just, just so that I'm clear, does the name Jimmy Savile mean anything to anyone here before I start? I know Evolt um, does, but does that mean anything to anyone else? Good. OK, well, that's fine. I'll explain. Um, this is Jimmy Savile. He's dead. Uh, but for many, many years, he was one of the most famous television presenters uh, to appear on the BBC. He was the first presenter of Top of the Pops, which is a very famous, iconic pop music programme that was came on on the BBC in the early 1960s. He moved to Radio 1, which was the uh, top pop station uh, broadcasting to half of uh, all, young, all Britons, not just young Britons, um, in the 60s and 70s. And he had a series of very, very popular television programmes, mainly involving um, doing um, things for children, making their dreams come true. It was called Jim Will Fix It. And, and the format was that a um, small child would come on the show and say, I'd like to drive a train, and Jim would fix it for them to drive a train. 
So a simple idea is incredibly popular and millions and millions and millions of people watched it. And he um, had this extraordinary career, one of the most famous men in Britain, very, very recognisable. But all the time, he was leading a double life as probably Britain's most prolific paedophile and uh, um, sex attacker, uh, typically preying on uh, young girls, either just above or below the age of consent. Uh, and um, he had a, um, a particularly sinister and unpleasant manner. Um, those of us who met him um, could never describe him as a, as a human being, but none of us could kind of quite put our finger on why he wasn't a human being. But he certainly had a threatening and aggressive and unpleasant manner, which was um, his cover, if you like. Um, and he also didn't engage in conversations. So um, imagine somebody that big, that famous, that powerful, um, running for 40, 50 years a double life as a prolific sex attacker. Now, the police in Britain describe him as the most prolific sex attacker who's ever lived in Britain and arguably the world. Um, so, you, you know, this is, the, this is kind of the, 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 the Stalin of paedophiles, if you like, and um, uh, a, a very, very unpleasant man. But he was employed by the BBC, and not just for a few years, his entire career. So you can imagine, by the way, there is a, a, a slightly lighter story about Jimmy Savile, which I'll bring you now. I have an American friend, and um, she, I showed her this picture. Um, obviously, she'd never heard of Jimmy Savile in America. And she said, but what I don't understand about you Brits is he's obviously a paedophile. Why didn't any of you notice? Uh, and, um, you know, again, that's maybe a, a failing of the, of, of the Brits. But anyway, um, you can imagine when this story broke, for a lot of the papers, it was as much a story about the BBC's incompetence at failing to notice, catch, punish, sack, whatever, Savile, uh, as, uh, you know, Savile himself, the perpetrator of these appalling crimes. Um, and it was a really tough thing for the BBC to deal with because, you know, you could argue that one way around this is to say this was a very bad man. We didn't know. We had no indication that he was doing this stuff. He's now dead and a lot of this stuff is historic and we're very sorry. Now, that may or may not work, uh, but it is clearly one strategy that you could deploy as a... As a, as a company that has employed a very bad man for a long period of time. Um, but what happened, really, um, was um, a, a golden opportunity, I suppose I would say, for the BBC's critics. And lots of people within the BBC also turned inwards. And, you know, I was asked at one point, well, you, you met him couple of times why didn't you realize that he was a dangerous paedophile and sort of dob him in because I didn't um, because nobody did because it was there was an act and we fell for it um, and also because the 60s and 70s and 80s was arguably a different time with different standards uh, in terms of protection of children and indeed you know, protection, let's face it, of women in the, in the workplace. Things were different for women who worked in the workplace in the 70s and 80s in terms of their, the sexual politics of, of workplaces at that time. The chairman of the BBC came out and told waiting reporters that the organisation was, quote, engulfed in a tsunami of filth. It's a great quote... But with the benefit of hindsight, it's not a great thing to say about your organisation if you're trying to limit damage. Uh, the word cesspit was another word that he used. So the BBC was a, a cesspit. Now, 
he he the chairman at the time was a politician, so he had an eye for a a headline, and I think he thought it was a genuine piece of damage limitation. Um, and I think he thought that by admitting that bad things had happened in the past, the BBC could then move on. But the problem with using words like cesspit and a tsunami of filth is they are spect- that's spectacular language, isn't it? It's really, really vivid, spectacular lang- language. And if you're a critic, you might want to use those words. But if you are the company, or corporation in our case, at the centre of it all, these are not words and phrases that you want to have coming out of your mouth. OK. And, and at the time, you know, BBC jokers, and God knows there are a lot of them, said, you know, how's life in the cesspit today? Um, and against this, and a, and a related story which became immensely complicated and I won't bore you with, the newly appointed chief executive of the organisation had to quit uh, and, and the BBC went into a kind of collective meltdown. He'd only been in the job for about 50 days. So working there, someone said to me, you know, it feels like you're a, a boxer and you're on the ropes, you know, you're halfway to the floor of the canvas, you're groggy but you're still conscious, um, you've been hit and hit and hit and hit again, and it just feels like another person's climbing into the ring, walking over to us and punching us one more time. And we're, you know, we're, we're, we're still reeling from a succession of jabs and right hooks and everything else. We're sagging on the ropes, and then someone else comes in and hits us again. And we couldn't break a cycle of announcements and a, a stream of stories that were related to this that kept, kept happening. Um, so, you know, corporately, I think at that time, um, we didn't handle it well. Uh, the people who were involved in running the PR side at, at that moment have, have left. And, and, you know, my impression was that if, if you take the bo- boxing analogy one stage further, our boxing gloves never came up to defend ourselves, let alone punch back. Um, now, uh, that's a kind of list of PR disasters. I'm, I'm just wondering if um, it's a particularly British uh, chain of uh, woe and horror. Um, I'm wondering if any similar things uh, apply in Austria. Can, is there an example of a, 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 a PR disaster, a, a situation badly handled that, that you can give me and explain to me for, for in a moment or two? Or Austrians are just very, very good at PR and don't make mistakes and nothing bad ever happens. Okay, well, that's fair enough. You see, I... Okay. I have a... An example, like it's it's not a complete PR disaster, and and it was not that yeah. big, yeah. Um, but it's um, quite like it's only one or two weeks old. Um, yeah, there is a, a online agency in yeah. in Vienna, or probably there are more, but yeah. at least um, one agency um, they got now public uh, because they offered um, uh, companies or political mm. parties like to uh, you know um, manipulate the online um, discussion about their yeah. like uh, the politician like the positions or a uh, the companies so they were public mm. owned companies uh, private companies and also politicians yeah. and um well i from my point of view the yeah. way uh the way like for instance the agency communicated well there was like if i remember correctly please correct me if if you, if you have other information well they were like they didn't say a lot um yeah just that that's not illegal, you know, yeah. to, to have, I don't know how many fake profiles. Yeah. Um, other companies um, or the political party, for instance, um, argued that, well, um, uh, we that's not true. We didn't know mm. about that. It's only the company. Like, uh, blame it on the others. Yeah. Um, so, well, it's not a big disaster, yeah. but it still was from, uh, I guess, uh, most of there was one bank. They said, okay, yeah, yeah we, we quit now the contract yeah. or at least... Um, like like freeze yeah, yeah. the the work um, until we know what what exactly happens. It is not a huge disaster, but yeah. I, from my point of view, it was not quite well handled yes. from all the like yeah. you know all the stakeholders in yeah. that conflict. Yeah, it's embarrassing, isn't it? And and difficult. And these things are not pleasant. So well, thank you for that. Thanks, Eddie. And and that that really makes sense. Um, so perhaps we should turn at this point, having 
given some examples, to what to do if you land in the mire, possibly how to stay out of it, um, and, uh, you, you know, that sort of thing. So, let's just run through these five tips, uh, and they're designed to be practical, and uh, see if they make some sense to you, and you'll certainly get the chance to question me about them uh, later. Firstly, if you're under fire, the first go golden rule is, should I react? Now, some people say, well, yeah, sure you should. If something bad's said about you, of course you should. Makes sense, doesn't it? But I'm not so sure. Because not every piece of bad publicity is widespread or damaging. And sometimes responding to them fuels the fire and makes a one-day newspaper story, for example, into a two-, three-, or four-day one. So first of all, you have to evaluate the scale of the problem that you might be dealing with. So that's, should I react? So first tip is, is how big is this? So, um, of course, it's, it's impossible, I said at the beginning, to kind of anticipate what's going to happen, what's going to happen. But if it's a tweet from somebody and it's got a tiny bit of pickup, a few retweets, a little bit of social media activity and it's damaging to your company and embarrassing, I'm not sure you should react. Okay, it's not brilliant. You'd rather it didn't happen. But rushing out a press release will allow newspapers to run a story that says your company denies allegation of dot, 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 whatever it is. So that turns a, a, a one-day or a two-hour Twitter storm into a newspaper story, which is then online and will then possibly have a day two or a day three impact. You don't know because we don't know often how long a news story will last. But um, it's not always a good thing to react. But what you need to have is a kind of level head and if you've got a PR team or a PR officer, hopefully he or she will be able to do this, to evaluate the scale of it, really watch what's going on on social media, if, if, if it's this example that I've cited, and, and make a judgment with you, because obviously the two of you need to work really closely together about this, and you need to take their good advice, and hopefully it'll be the right advice about whether you should or shouldn't respond. The second point is uh, counterintuitive to what I've just said. And it's really this, that if you are going to react, you've got to react quickly. Because most of the really big PR cock-ups and the ones that I've just explained um, have all had one thing in common, that there's been a do-nothing. Let's do nothing. We're scared. It's bad. It's very bad out there. I'm very scared. I'm getting more scared all the time. I'm really, really scared now. I'm not going to do anything. Okay? And then day two comes along. I'm now even more scared. I'm even more frightened. It's really, really bad. Oh, my God. What are we going to do? Ah, let's do nothing. And so it goes on. So it's really important to react quickly if you're going to react at all. And what you don't want is days and days and days and days of unmitigated criticism of your company uh, running against you. You need to get out there and battle back. Um, OK, we'll talk about battling back now. Uh, and, and that means if you are battling back, don't lie. There is nothing worse than lying. Don't ever lie. If something bad has happened, you're going to need to say something bad has happened and we're sorry. And we're going to do something about it. You don't sweep it under the carpet. You don't deny it if it's true. You just don't do that. Why? Um, and, you know, you're, I can hear you say, well, you're a journalist. Of course, you would say that. But with my journalist hat on or with a PR hat on, it doesn't make any difference. Um, if you lie, you are then running the risk of journalists finding out the truth. If they find out the truth, they will run the truth and you will then be a corporate liar. Think of the damage to you and your company on a corporate level if you are proved to be a liar. It's just 
too damaging. It's just too dangerous. You just don't go there. Don't lie. Tell the truth. If you need to confess, do so. You supply context. So you don't allow the papers to hit you, hit you, hit you, hit you. You supply, well, this happened because. You know, we're very sorry, but this happened because. And, and we are looking at our procedures and analysing what we could have done better for future reference. It's better by far to admit a mistake early than to be forced into some embarrassing, damaging climb down, um, you know, in the face of some other journalistic inquiry or evidence. You need to be transparent. You need to show your workings. People forgive mistakes. If you've made a mistake and you said, look, I'm really sorry, we made a mistake here. Very bad. Sorry. People will respect you for it. They won't respect you if you lie. Um, and it's really important to bear that in mind. OK, the fourth point is your public face. If you have a strong and charismatic chief executive, it makes sense to let him or her do the performance, whether it's I'm sorry or we're denying it or whatever you, your corporate line is. That's good. However, lots of chief executives have big egos and are bad at TV. And someone's got to tell them that. I know it's not easy, but there's got to be somebody in your firm, in your company, who's got to do the public face stuff. And it's probably better to address this now before you're in the headlines than later. Because you're doing them a big favour, despite the size of their ego, if you can persuade them that they are not best served by going on telly and making a right something naughty bad word of themselves. Because um, it does happen. Uh, and it happens because sometimes out of ego, but sometimes because chief executives think, well, I must take responsibility. I must be seen to do that. And if that's the case and they're a bad television performer, you really need to prep them incredibly well. And you need to get them to say something and not divert from what they're saying. Because journalists are very good at getting you to say, to ask the same question again and again and again and again. And you give a different answer sooner or later. And that's the answer that's off script. And that's the quote that will be used. And that's your tsunami of filth equivalent or whatever it is that, that is very damaging. So uh, really drilling this is so important. And I, and I guess... You know, there's an example from the BBC here. Um, it's kind of uncomfortably close to home, but the, the BBC's chief executive at the time of the aftermath of Savile um, was uh, a very good man called uh, George Entwistle. And um, uh, one of the multiple stories that spun out of the Savile thing um, was another mistake. Um, and um, he was pulled onto the Today programme, which is Radio 4, the biggest news and current affairs radio show in, 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 in the UK, and questioned by its kind of arch inquisitor, its, its, its chief presenter, who's a very intelligent and very good interviewer. And um, I, I felt that George was not well prepared for it, and um, he was clearly under immense personal pressure. And... Um, the interviewer, it's interesting because this is an example and it shows how, I suppose, democratic the BBC is in the sense that the employee is questioning the boss in a very aggressive way. Um, but it was a disaster. And it's available online if you want to listen. It's 15 minutes long. And it's embarrassing. It's incredibly embarrassing because uh, the poor guy uh, starts off with a position which he tries to defend. And it's chipped away at, chipped away at, chipped away at, chipped away at, and he's pretty incoherent at the end. And it's not, it's not pretty. Within 24 hours, he'd had to resign. So, um, you know, on one hand, the BBC obviously ate itself and destroyed itself. But on the other hand, the, serious, the very serious point for you guys is putting somebody on who isn't either up to it or properly briefed and properly rehearsed 
is not just a disaster for your company, which is obviously the worst thing, but a personal disaster for them and their career, which is perhaps as a supportive colleague, uh, just as bad. Um, so if you can tackle those difficult internal politics issues, it might well be worth doing. God knows why we got back to him. I must have pressed something. Okay, um, so uh, the spokesman is, is really, really important. Finally, step five, and it's related to that, is show sincerity. It's very easy for me to say this. It's much harder to do. Um, but lack of sincerity is one of the things that really shows through with audiences when you test with an audience, how do you think this company dealt with this mistake? And um, audiences are very smart and very intelligent at, at reading through kind of lack of sincerity. So if you look cross, and cross is easy, isn't it? Because you, you're being, you go out into steps of your company and there are 100 reporters and they're all saying, well, what are you doing? And you get cross because they're quite aggressive with you. And, and what do people do? men particularly, but women as well, you get defensive and you get cross back. And that's the clip they'll use on television, you being cross. And that's not a good look. So it's really important to keep that sincerity going. If, if your message is, I'm sorry, we made a mistake, we got it wrong, you're going to have to keep saying that again and again and again, or you're going to have to say it once and get off quickly. Um, because um, you can't afford to get yourself wound up. You've got to mean what you say. So those are the, the five tips, and they may seem fairly intuitive, but uh, when you're under pressure, it's worth just going back to that, because you'd be surprised how quickly things spiral out of control, and you think, oh my God, I wish I'd thought about whether we actually needed to react in the first place. And we have, and now we've got this really big story, and, you know, it's a disaster. So I'm gonna, I've got some hints and uh, tricks as well to kind of go with that. I think, first of all, you have to be really careful of poking the internet snake. This is not uh, a, a, a weird British code for some bizarre practice. Um, you wouldn't go up to a king cobra and shove a stick at it repeatedly. Uh, and you'd, you'd expect very unpleasant consequences if you did so. So what I mean is if the internet operates 24 by 7 and you may be tired, frustrated, angry, uh, you may be drunk or slightly drunk uh, and you could be angered by attacks uh, personally on you and re reply. And I get a lot of this from... This scenario applies to a lot of television, particularly, but radio as well, um, presenters. And um, people are nasty, and they attack them in quite a personal way, you know, and they might... Um, there are all sorts of you, you you can imagine some of it's really really unpleasant and it's it's there on social media and on their on their twitter timeline and all the rest of it and they respond sometimes unwisely and they say something rude or equally horrible back to person and that's the bit that's going to get reported in the papers not the initial insult it's the response so um this is about a presenter and a, an individual situation, but it could just as well be about your company, which is why I mention it. Don't respond. Stop. Before you tweet back or respond in that way, stop. Wait and think. Count to ten. Do what you want. Don't respond to criticism with capital letters because it looks like you're mad and shouting. And don't use profanity. Of course, the person's an effing idiot, but you're not going to say that on uh, your Twitter timeline, are you? Because it's going to make you look very bad. Um, you've got to be dignified. So you look, in my opinion, my advice is ignore abuse on Twitter. Just don't respond to it. 
people are like that. You know, they, it's like they don't re regard social media as a normal conversation. I wouldn't be rude to someone in that way if I was talking to them in the street. But people feel they can be in some way in social media. Well, fine, that's their problem, not yours. Don't respond. Uh, I think people who don't respond look dignified, and I think that's good. Um, if the facts are erroneous, then you might want to at least put the truth. But that's all. Don't counter insults with greater insults. Don't get into a chain of arguments. And don't, you know, do that. And another thing. Um, Apologise, as ever, whether, whether this is social media or any other way. Apologise if you, something's gone wrong. Move on. You know, don't make this last. The second thing I would say on, on hints and tips is the phrase, no comment. There are lots of companies, um, and sadly still some PR people, who think that no comment is a, is a, is a good option. Um, if a damaging story runs about you, you might be tempted to avoid the issue and hope that it goes away by saying no comment. But I think you should think about how that would look in a long blog or a newspaper article or a television news package uh, which alleges a string of very uh, serious and damaging things about you, your company, etc., etc. No comment in the context of that much newspaper article looks really bad. It looks like you're guilty. Uh, so there are better forms of words, and um, it's fairly easy. Good PR people will help you with this, but it's fairly easy to work around corporate matters that might involve individuals, for example, because you can cite uh, privacy or internal inquiry processes that will sound much better than no comment. You know, we're looking at the way that what happened, we're investigating the chain of events that led to this, da 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 da, -da. You know, you're not really saying anything. But it's, it looks and sounds better and makes you look more serious. I think on the bigger issues, if you don't have your own in-house PR people, it might be worth hiring someone in quickly when this happens because the cost is clearly a fraction in terms of the potential damage caused. Silence can be OK um, because this takes me back to the should I react thing. Um, it's a tough call about you know, not responding, and it does require some fine judgment. But, again, you know, a tit-for-tat response to small things can lead to a kind of damaging race to the bottom of the barrel, I think, you know, which will harm, again, you and your business. I think one of the golden rules about everyone, that everyone in public service, and let's, let's be fair, you know, private business as well, knows that you can turn a complaint into a positive by dealing with the customer well. You know, so you change the damaged goods, uh, or you put them on a better phone tariff than the one that they were being that they're complaining about, and 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 save them money, and that quickly turns from I really don't like you and I'm cross into oh they sorted it out for me that's great. So try and equate that scenario that I've just described into your media relations. So how can people feel warm and fuzzy about you because of what you do? I think you need to act like a human being, outperforming. Uh, a PR disaster can be incredibly positive for you and your company. Take Apple. 20 years ago, some of you will remember, it was an incredibly bad way. It was being slaughtered by PC products and Microsoft. And uh, Apple had become irrelevant, and they'd chucked out their founder, Steve Jobs. But he returned to the company, and the company started making products they weren't just better, technically, than their rivals, but sexier too. So it became a design thing as well. A, r a thing of real beauty, if you like. Now, uh, most people here and everywhere else in the world can't remember Apple's appalling struggles. They just remember where they are now. They've, they dealt with the customer dissatisfaction which existed at the time. They fixed the problem. They made the product better, and they've moved on. And now no one would say, you know... Yes, they would. But within reason, no one would say that um, Apple have got a, a problem in, in the way that they had 20 years ago. 
Okay. So let's just talk about Twitter for a moment because uh, the company account, if you have one, can be a real menace. Who is logged into it and do they know that they're still logged into it? I have personal experience of a, a site that I was responsible for and I had happily delegated a maintenance of the site to an individual who um, got drunk, didn't realise they were logged in uh, to the business account and started saying things they really shouldn't have done about sex. Um, it was hugely embarrassing, not least for them personally, but it was pretty um, embarrassing for me, to be honest. And I, you know, I had to kind of look at the way that we we let people have access and how they had access and uh, checks and balances in terms of making sure that, that couldn't happen again. So here's one example. This is uh, someone uh, logged into Vodafone U UK. Uh, this is a Vodafone employee, and he sent this um, very unpleasant, homophobic and obscene tweet. And not unnaturally, coming from the Vodafone UK account, um, it triggered a storm of complaints. Now, the company's first response, this takes you back to what I was talking about a while ago, said, we've been hacked. It's not us, we've been hacked. Oh dear. They hadn't been hacked. It was an employee. Um, it was an own goal. And so, of course, it was quickly established that they hadn't been hacked. And uh, you won't be surprised to hear that the employee was subsequently suspended and that there are now much tighter uh, rules and regs about who gets login rights to the Vodafone UK Twitter account. And then there's, you know, the, the other thing is the kind of humour misfire. At the height of the Arab Spring with uproar in Egypt, the fashion firm Kenneth T Cole tweeted this. And the hashtag Cairo reference, which you see in front of you, uh, hashtag Cairo, yeah, brought thousands of people to the tweet because people were following the hashtag Cairo at the time. And they were really, really angry that what they saw as an appalling personal, uh, appalling human disaster in Egypt was um, turned into a jokey subject by a fashion firm. Now, um, this wasn't a... Uh, it wasn't the Vodafone thing. This was a deliberate attempt by Kenneth Cole to be witty and topical um, and, and to reference their new spring collection. Uh, but what they had to do, because there was such anger about it, was to apologise. We made a mistake. And again, you know, what's the, what's the key lesson? Well, you know, I love marketing. I love smart advertising. I love... Uh, good use of social media, it's what I do and, uh, you know, what I've always encouraged. But where people are losing their lives, and it's a serious topic, it's not a topic for humour. Um, you know, nowadays, jokes about Ebola are clearly uh, bad, um, and, and you wouldn't want to do that. So... Uh, Let's go back to where we began, really. You know, uh, that elderly prime minister uh, in Britain in the late, late 1950s with the world changing around him and uh, the, the media in, in the UK much more, uh, much less respectful than it had been for all its life. And it's never been particularly respectful. Um, and uh, he felt battered. Um, and he felt battered by events, the things that happened to him. He wasn't elected. Uh, to deal with these problems that suddenly happened. He was hoping to sort out, you know, a bit of this and something else and a bit of the health service and all the rest of it. And instead of which he had African countries in uproar, demands for independence from Britain's empire was falling apart and the economy was in a bad way and um, the world was changing and there were all these disrespectful young people wearing jeans and listening to pop music and... It was just bad for him. It was just unsettling. And so he said this, this line that I said at the beginning about its, its events. 
its events. He felt he'd learnt that events just come along and hit you, and it's just uh, unpleasant. And actually, you know, it's like life, isn't it? You, you're happily going along one day and everything's fine, and then something bad happens, and you have to deal with it. Now, he lived in a, in a world long before, uh, you know, social media. And um, uh, what I think you have to deal with, what we have to deal with, um, whichever side of the kind of PR fence you're on, is um, you have to learn when these unwanted and unwarranted things happen, you have to learn how to react positively and quickly and, re and proportionately to the events to manage the corporate damage that you face. Because I think, again, the danger is if you don't, it'll effectively kill you or your business. And I don't mean that in the literal sense, but certainly figuratively, it does enormous damage to you, your life, your company, your standing, your professional standing, your company's standing, and you've got to do this stuff well. So um, that is, is where we started. And really, uh, I guess the most sensible thing for me to say now is I'm very happy to take any questions that you have. Um, and, uh, you know, do you think that we've, we've kind of dealt with some of those issues that uh, we raised right at the beginning of the, of the talk? So over to you. And there are some exciting refreshments waiting as well, which uh, I mean, so you can either you can either talk to me now uh, or you, you might want to sort of uh, eat, eat and drink There's some beer in the fridge, I think. Thank you very much, Mr. McKenzie, for the um, very interesting speech. We have a question from a uh, like a viewer from. Like at home or the office. How or exciting. Wherever. That's yes. great. Social and I got media. it by um, um, SMS, so I would like to address the question to you. Yeah. The question was um, when you were talking about the, um, no, not responding. And so the question is, when I do not respond to something that casts a shadow on my company, isn't that a kind of agreement approval? Well, this is, this is the fine judgment that you have to make. And I think it's probably, what I would say is it's really unfair for one individual to make that judgment. I think you, you let's say, I've got a PR professional. I, let's say I'm the chief executive. We've got a PR professional and maybe I've got a deputy. And we're a tight team and we're thinking something bad has happened. Uh, what do we do or not do? And I take you back and I take the... Uh, the questioner back to what I said at the beginning, which is that it is perfectly possible in life to get some bad things said and done, uh, said about you and live through it without responding. You don't have to respond. And, and you know, my example benchmark is, is a fairly low one. So somebody says something about you damaging on Twitter, but it's not really picked up. It's got a couple of retweets. Um... It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Watch it. Keep watching it. Keep watching it. Um, but it's going nowhere. Um, I, um, uh, uh, m my daughter works in, in, in this industry, and one of her jobs is that she has to watch social media quite late at night to see if people are saying something, anything negative about a very famous company whose name I can't tell you. Um, and she then has to make a judgment about whether that's worth telling people about or not. So that's this is a professional PR company, and clearly there's a lot of money at stake here. Um, so somebody has to do that job. Um, now, the, 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 her, the company that she works for, View, which I agree with, is that bad stuff can happen on social media at that low level, and it's just bad stuff on social media. It's just the equivalent of that TV presenter, female TV presenter is getting a bit of grief because somebody didn't like her red dress. And she's saying, you look, yeah. and it's horrible and unpleasant, but just don't respond to it. It's not worth it. It's a couple of saddos uh, and a couple of retweets. You can live with it. Um, by responding, you can turn it into a story. Now, what the question 
then says is, I feel really bad about not defending my company if something bad has happened. I agree with you, and I think that's right. But you've got to be proportionate. Because you can turn that tiny, tiny thing that's going on in social media that no one's ever bloody noticed into some huge thing by coming out with some big, macho corporate statement. You just wouldn't want to do it. If it's on the front page of the national newspaper, you're going to have to respond, and you're going to have to respond well, and you should. But there's a difference between those two scales. So one is, yes, you have to. It's going to be on the front page of whatever paper and you really don't because it's a loony and a couple of retweets um, so the judgment is somewhere between the two if you get yourself in a position where I'm so defensive if anybody says anything bad about our company I'm going to get really angry you're in the wrong game because that's no way to play this that's that's not smart that's not a smart response you, you've got to be proportionate so I hope that answers your question as question. I hope so. <laughs> yes. Are there any further questions? Yes, I have a question. Do you think that you were talking about this guy selling crap jewelry and went bankrupt? Yes. Do you think that the possible financial disaster out of a PR disaster is nowadays less or reduced because there's more or less every hour, every day, another shit storm for a different company? I was thinking about this PR disaster yeah. from Nestle yeah. with KitKat. Yeah. And more or less, I don't think that out of this huge PR disaster, which it was, I don't think anyone is buying less KitKat than yeah. before. Yeah. The, the thing about the KitKat story, is, as I understand it, and you must correct me about this because I know less about it than you do, is that it didn't really break out of, that, uh, of Italy. It didn't really go global. I don't know either. Right. No. Okay, that, that's my impression. Okay. You know, there didn't seem to be... Uh, you, you know, in Britain, what didn't seem to be a pickup. I'll, I'll do a Google search in a moment and let you know. But it certainly, it didn't impact on me, and it, I think it would have done if it had been big. So, um, but your question is, uh, it can do a lot of damage, yes. Um, but every every situation is different. And some come along and they hit you a bit and make you groggy, but you pick yourself and get up uh, and carry on some of the bbc stuff you know the bbc is under a pretty rel relentless uh, assault from other media and i'm not saying that's wrong and i'm not criticizing other media because there are good competitive reasons for why they do that but actually the bbc's reputation with most people in the uk is still very high so the bbc might have employed jimmy savile for 40 years and not noticed that he was the world's worst pedophile but They sort of don't blame the BBC for that. What they want is good programs and other stuff, and they think that, by and large, they get it. And they will have criticisms of the BBC from time to time, but not in the kind of terminal, it-must-die way. Yeah, um, that, 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 I got the feeling that the outrage is coming even bigger and bigger any time there's a shitstorm, yeah. but also it's becoming, the time frame is yeah. becoming shorter and shorter. People think about it because in the next day they yeah. think about something different. I think, I think that's the thing. I think a lot of this stuff is a, is a bit manufactured, really. You know, it's a kind of manufactured anger. So, um, you know, as a journalist, I, I can recognize that sometimes newspapers flam up, we would say in, in, in the UK, a story. So it's quite a small story about somebody who's done something bad and a bit embarrassing and whatever. And it suddenly becomes this huge shame. You know, they love in British newspapers, all the shame. Everyone's always shame, sex shame, drug shame, you know, nude picture shame, whatever it is. And they love that. Um, but it's not really. Uh, and actually, people kind of get over a lot of this stuff. And there isn't life moves on and nobody dies. So, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think... Uh, I hope you never work with a PR who's completely terrified because that's just not, not right. It's, it's, it's got to be proportionate. Are there any further questions? Maybe, maybe it's an expectable question, but where do you see the the, f the role and or the future of classic media, let's say TV, radio, newspapers, okay, yeah, compared to social media, when we see this this race of different channels and yeah. so on and the usage by the people? 
It's a really good question. And, um, you know, most of the work that I've been doing for Evolt this week has been, you know, addressing that very topic um, with, with the students here and, and with my other uh, keynote speech. Um, now, again, um, if I was, if I knew the answer to the question, uh, I'd be very, very rich and probably living in Beverly Hills. Um, so I don't know the answer to the question, but it's a good question and I'll have a go at answering it. Uh, and it is this, that media organisations cannot afford to be monomedia anymore. So everyone is on the move. And, um, you know, when I first uh, joined uh, what might broadly be called, you know, the radio industry uh, 35 years ago, I guess, um, it was, that was my business. It was radio, you know, stuff that came out of a speaker. Um, but now it's visual and we film people doing radio. Um, it's not television, but it's visualisation. And uh, we take pictures and we use them online. So it, there's a, just a big mashup going on of, of different media. And if you work at The Guardian, which is one of the big papers in, in the UK... Uh, famous, well-established uh, newspaper. Uh, last year, or I think last year, might have been the year before, the journalists were told their primary function was to get their work online. So not in the newspaper first, online. Uh, I spoke to a group of news editors and reporters in BBC Local Radio in April this year, and I said, your job... When you go on a story, the first thing you do, these are radio reporters, first thing you do is tweet. That's what you do first. So the answer to your question is in some of this stuff. It's, so what we're asking people to do now in BBC Local Radio is to go to the scene of the fire and tweet. I'm at the, there's a big fire. The, the carpet warehouse is on fire. Twitter. Tweet. Then a picture. Tweet. We'll retweet from the business account. Uh, and then you go and do your interviews. Uh, and you take more pictures. And you then file a, a radio piece. You're capable of doing a TV piece. Possibly a TV live. Uh, you write an online piece which has got fantastic pictorial content in it. So all the barriers fall down. And that's the way the media is going in the UK. Um, and that's the model that I think we're all going to face. So the, short, the really short answer to your question is that I think all the media organisations, whether they're social media primarily or radio primarily in, in old money, are all heading into the same place. And that's being first there. Because that's the future. That's the, that's the device which is most important. Not TV. That's most important because that's where all the content will come at us. Now, we might, you know, when we get home, we might mirror our, our mobile to our TV and watch some of that content. But it's actually hitting me there first that matters. Does that help your question? Yeah. Cool. Question at the back? Yeah. In business and countries yeah. like Germany or Austria, where it's not, not used in such a big way. Yes. And do you think it will come to, to our countries as well or yeah. not? Yeah. Do you know what? I, d I don't really know because I think I can probably only answer the question if I knew more about Austrian and, and German social media use and, and uh, you know, I lived here. Um, but uh, what I would say from the British experience is that things change. And um, groups of people who, s who weren't using something suddenly start using something. And uh, do, you, do you know BuzzFeed? Does BuzzFeed mean anything to you? Um, probably a couple of years ago in Britain, uh, I'll talk about Britain because obviously I know it best, um, nobody heard of BuzzFeed, apart from some really cool kids who, who, who might have done. Um, 
And now um, it's talked about and shared because it does lists, you know, 20 things that go with Vienna schnitzel, uh, you know, whatever it is. 20 colours not to wear on Christmas Day, 20 people never to say boo to. Um, uh, and it's very, very shareable and fun and people kind of use that. Um, but it was nowhere two years ago. Um, you know, and, and there are things like Vine and Instagram and Vice and HuffPost and Gorka, um, all of which were minor or marginal a short time ago, which are getting bigger and are threatening the big players like the BBC and, and others. And that will continue. Why isn't it happening in Germany and Austria? I'm not sure. Um, uh, sometimes these things are led by... Um, you know, a cohort of the audience, either young people who are kind of very cool and on the cutting edge of this stuff, or people with money to spend, um, maybe chief executives or senior people in business who can afford to buy, be the first to buy iPads and think, what am I going to do with this iPad? And, oh, what's this Twitter thing? I'll start doing it. Because actually in, in the UK, Twitter was biggest first with professional and media groups, um, and not with young people. The, the opposite happened with Facebook. In, in the UK, Facebook was huge with young people to start with, really cool, and now it's declining, still big, but declining quite rapidly because your mum and dad are on Facebook and, and, that, and your grandparents are on Facebook. So you put stuff on Facebook, if you're young in Britain, that you don't mind your parents and grandparents seeing. But if it was a really crazy night out and you ended up, uh, you know, underneath somebody else, um, you would use different means of social media to communicate that to your friends. Do you see what I mean? So what we've got in Britain is Facebook huge, uh, started with young people, got very big now, declining for the reasons I've said. Twitter started off with well-educated people with money, older, 50-somethings, uh, and it's gone really young, and, um, and, it's, and it's spread. And old people in Britain, they're now on Facebook, but they're not really on Twitter because it's just a bit too kind of scary. Um, but it's all, it's all changing all the time. And um, I'm sorry, I, I can't answer your question, but maybe it's, the, maybe it's the English language thing, I don't know with Twitter, um, and maybe it'll change. You know, next year, it'll be, it'll be big. I mean, you guys, do you use Twitter at all? No, no. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. There are, in, in the UK, there are a lot of people who use Twitter as a kind of uh, information stream, but don't get involved. They don't retweet, they don't post stuff themselves and all the rest of it. Um, but then there are real kind of keen people who are tweeting God knows how many times a day. It's just it's one of those things. I, I mean, I think in five years' time, we might well not be talking at all about Twitter, but there'll be something else, won't there? You know, Instagram is, 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 is growing all the time in the UK, for example. Um, and there are so many others. Okay, are there any further more questions? Well, if not, then thank you very much once again, Mr. McKenzie. Pleasure. For being here in St. Walton tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, and, Hi. well, um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight and also watching us um, from, like, from at home, mobile, probably, as well. <laughs> um, and uh, we are now pleased to invite you to a small riff, like, to some refreshments. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>